everybody. I just want to let you know that if you're at home or in a car or in some place watching the service today, we actually have people in our services <laughs> so you can come and be a part of our service anytime you want to. And we'd love for you to be here. Uh, but this morning, we want to give thanks to God, give thanks to the Lord. It goes like this. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good. He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm. His love endures forever. everybody. Good morning, morning to the people that are here. Good morning to those who are online. Uh, good morning to those who are watching us like on Wednesday of next week because they didn't get around to watching us today. We'll welcome you as well. Uh, those are the people that slept in really late this morning. They're not watching us till Wednesday. Uh, but we are glad that you guys are here and I just want to let you guys know as you come in um, if you are here, uh, we have communion cups there in the back. Um, go ahead and grab one of those. We are going to be having communion today, and I know it's not the first Sunday of the month. Last uh, week was, but I forgot. Um, I forgot communion, so we're doing it today. Um, I know, but God's forgiven me. Uh, so we'll work on that. So if you're at home watching and you want to participate in communion, go grab something right now uh, and bring it back and have it ready. Um, it'll be... Uh, uh, towards the in the middle to the end of our singing so you can that's when we're going to have it so go ahead you have plenty of time to go get one uh, we do have a few announcements today uh, we are ending two of our drives today uh, both our our food drive and our shoe boxes uh, drive uh, we have met our goal uh, on the uh, on the veggies so uh, there's only 98 up here but uh, we had somebody drop off a couple cans at my place so with those two cans, we have exactly 100. We met our goal on the veggies, so uh, great job. Um, and then on the shoe boxes, they also have to be turned in tomorrow. Uh, it's both those things, so we'll be taking them after the service. Uh, but the shoe boxes, I think our final total with the people who've done them online that's told me about them is uh, 17 or 18. 
Um, it's not our record, but there are still 17 or 18 uh, kids that are going to be uh, touched by Jesus this morning or this uh, this year because uh, you guys were willing to give. Um, and then our regular uh, announcements, uh, our live group, Monday night uh, live groups, if you want to be a part of that, let me know. I can get you the, the sign-in information, uh, and we, you can be uh, a part of that as well. I believe that's all I got, right? Yep. Uh, PowerPoint lady says that's it. That means I didn't put anything else in there. Um, actually, I do have something else. Uh, uh, you guys know that we support uh, several missionaries and missional organizations. Uh, and we did get a, uh, one of them is uh, Romeo Ceriso. Um, he's working at the forgot with uh, the, the Baptist Forgotten People uh, in Canada. He's been working because of covid uh, it's taken him a couple years to be able to get in there, but it looks like they're going to be going in. So here's his newsletter um, I got uh, last week, and I'll post it up on the bulletin board if you want to keep up with, with how uh, that he is, is doing in, in that ministry because part of our offerings that we give go towards uh, taking, uh, taking care of them as well. Uh, one last thing that we don't talk much in, in our church about um, church membership. You know, because everybody is welcome here. Uh, and whether or not you're an official member or not, and some people don't even understand what it means to be a member. I just want to take a couple minutes because we do have people that are members, official members of our church that um, right now aren't coming. And we have people who are coming that maybe want to be members of our church. Uh, if you go on online to our website, we do have our bylaws. And in our bylaws, it, it tells you, uh, what our requirements are for membership. Uh, Article 5, church membership is requirement of a person desiring membership. A personal statement of repentance towards God and confession of faith in Jesus Christ before the pastor and living a biblical-based lifestyle. Uh, or we also accept transfer of memberships uh, from a member in good standing from another congregation. Uh, and you have to be 16 years uh, of uh, age or older. Uh, so that's not a whole lot of requirements uh, for membership in this church. Um, but if you are interested in becoming a, a full-fledged member of our congregation, uh, come and see me. We can go over them, see, make sure that, that you are uh, on the same page as we are. Uh, it's a good idea to go and look at our bylaws, see what we believe. We have statement of faith on there so you know what we believe and see if you still want to be a part of that. Um, so just uh, let me know. Now, being a, a member, official member of the, the church has nothing to do with whether or not you're welcome here or not. Um, I have been uh, in churches where people uh, have been coming to that church for 16 years and are not members. But uh, the, a, there are just some extra things like uh, being able to vote on issues, uh, being members of the church board and things like that that require church membership. So it's something that we never get around to talking about and, and several times I've tried to get it into the message but it just never seems to, to fit so I thought you know what I'm just going to take the time today to talk about it so if that's something that you are interested in come and see me and we will we'll take care of that all right our uh, our scripture passage for this morning is uh, Psalms 119 verse 33 through 49 teach me O Lord the way of your statutes and I shall observe it to the end Give me understanding that I might observe your law and I can keep it with all my heart. Make me walk in the path of your commandments for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to dishonest gain. Turn away my eyes from looking at vanity and revive me in your ways. Establish your word in your servant as that will produce reverence for you. Turn away my reproach which I dread your ordinances are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me through your righteousness. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that you've given us. We thank you, Lord, that, that we can see how much you love through your word. We can understand how much you love us because of the Bible. And Lord, we just ask that it becomes not just something that we need to do every morning and we can check off the box, but it's something that we desire, that we need as our daily bread to spend time in your word. And 
Lord, as I pray now as we begin our service, Lord, we want you on our hearts this morning. And if there are things in our lives, Lord, that, that you need to speak to this morning through the songs or through the message or through scripture, Lord, I pray that we listen because now we're opening up our hearts and our minds and our ears to hear you this morning. And we pray all this in your name. Amen. You're the God of the sea. You're the King of these people. You're the Lord of this nation.
Jesus Messiah. to you what Paul wrote about having celebrating the Lord's Supper. Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So that's what we're doing here this morning. That is what we're celebrating. Jesus' willingness to take our place, to suffer and die, to shed his blood for us. And, and that is what we're doing this morning. So if you guys, you have your communion cups, uh, there is a little cellophane on the top that you can pull back and get the wafer out. Uh, and if Paul says that when Jesus, before he gave them the bread, he said, he prayed. And so I'm going to pray for our bread right now. My Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you were willing to take our place. Lord, you came down from heaven in all of your glory so that you could sacrifice yourself for me. Lord, I just want to thank you. I want to remember constantly in my life what you have done for me. That's why we take this bread this morning, Lord. Help us remember what you did for us. So as he also took the cup and prayed for it. And Randy, would you pray for our juice? Lord, I, I remember the time that I stood in front of a, a guy that was, said it sometimes seems so gory in church because it talks about blood. God, you said without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. No remission of sin. So, Lord, we thank you for all that you did for us. We have a visual in our minds of what you did, what you went through by shedding your blood. And by taking what we're taking today in this cup, it's reminding us what you did. We're so grateful for what you did. And we praise your holy name and thank you for allowing this very special time to remember. In Jesus' name, we take this cup and pray. Amen. Jesus says, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Randy, let's finish the song. His body, the bread, his blood the wine broken and poured out all from love the whole earth trembled there was torn love so amazing love so Jesus. 
Jesus Messiah, the name above all names, blessed Blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, God is with us. The rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus the Thank you, Randy. Uh, you notice Randy is here alone uh, this morning. Faye is, is uh, under the weather this morning, not feeling well. Um, and uh, I, I know that, that Randy desires to be here with us, but he also desires to be with his sick wife as well. So uh, I, I really thank him for being here uh, this morning um, to help lead us into uh, to worship. Uh, today, we're going to uh, look at living the focused life. See, uh, living the focused life is not always an easy, easy, easy thing. To, it's not even an easy thing to say. Uh, an easy thing to do in, in today's world. It's so hard to live a focused life because there are so many things that are screaming and vying for our attention. Work, family, TV. Music, church, Facebook, and Instagram all want our attention. What sometimes gets lost and buried in all of that noise is a simple knocking of Jesus from Revelations 3.20. Listen to how the New Living translates that verse. Look, I stand at the door and knock, and if you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. See, our lives get so full that sometimes we have trouble focusing on just listening. When was the last time you sat still and quiet and listened to what God wanted to say to you? Silent, not listening to Caleb or not thinking about what you needed to get done, not hearing the traffic or the sounds of nature, just focusing 
on listening to God's voice. For most of us, it's been far, far too long. We think that we're great at multitasking, but in reality, we're not as good as we think that we are. Let me read to you this article from the Harvard, Harvard Business Review, December uh, 2010. The year end is a busy time for almost everyone, and as we use our smartphones to confirm online gift orders, we're also trying to wrap up those work tasks that we should have finished in November. We feel overwhelmed, but also productive, pleased with our ability to juggle so many things. But in reality, that sort of behavior makes us less effective in our jobs and our lives. Based on over half a century of cognitive science and more recent studies on multitasking, we know that multitaskers do less and miss information. It takes time, an average of 15 minutes, to reorient to a primary task after a distraction such as reading an email. Efficiency can drop by as much as 40%. Long-term memory suffers and, and creativity, a skill associated with keeping in mind multiple less common associations is reduced. We have a brain with billions of neutrons and many trillions of connections, but we seem incapable of doing multiple things at the same time. Sadly, multitasking does not exist, at least not as we think about it. We instead switch tasks. Our brain chooses which information to process. For example, if you listen to speech, your visual cortex becomes less active. So when you talk on the phone to a client and work on your computer at the same time, you literally hear less of what the client is saying. So that came from an actual business magazine. But let me share with you a fable that really illustrates how many of us spend our life distracted by this or that. And at the end of the day, we find that we've really accomplished very little. And we find that not only did we accomplish very little, but what we really needed, what we really needed to do gets lost in the chaos of life. So the fable goes like this. A hungry tiger started tracking the scent of a deer. And as he followed the deer, he came across the scent of a rabbit. So he turned aside and began following the rabbit. And then he was distracted by the scent of a mouse and started following that. He finally came to the hole in which the mouse had vanished. And he ended up the day hungrier than when he had started the day. So how do we stay focused on God in the midst of everything that we need to do? How can we listen for and hear him with all the noise that's going around in, uh, uh, in our lives? And I hope that we can find some answers this morning in our passage today. We're going to be in Philippians 3, uh, 10 through 16. And I hope that that gives us a focus for our lives, a spiritual focus. The Apostle Paul was a busy man. He had a big job to do. Spreading the good news to the Roman Empire, starting churches, writing half the New Testament, spending time in jail after jail. Pretty busy guy. In our passage today, in verse 13, Paul says this, This one thing I do. Notice he didn't say a hundred things I start, or a dozen things that I attempt, but one thing I do. See, Paul says he's putting all his energy into one thing, pressing towards the goal. I struggle with this concept a lot of the time in my life. I get involved in too many projects and end up doing less than my best with many of them. And when it comes to my church work, I have to make a weekly list of all the things I need to do and then prioritize them to make sure I stay focused on what needs to be done. When it's the time I set aside for writing my message, I sometimes get distracted and think about a Facebook post that I need to do or prep for the board meeting or getting all the PowerPoint slides together for my part of the service. Even making sure the electronics are charged before the next Sunday tries to take my focus off the time I need to put into the message. I fight the focus stealing thoughts by praying over the message each time I sit down to work on it. I also use the list that I make uh, so that I can make sure I don't forget anything and I stay clear about what I need to do and in what order it needs to be done in. And I have even recently posted this German proverb uh, on my desk. He who begins too much accomplishes little. He who begins too much accomplishes little. Maybe you're also having trouble 
living the focused life. And if so, I'm hoping that this message of Paul's will help us stay focused on the spiritual things that we need to focus on. I'm hoping that this passage of Paul's uh, focused life will help both you and I understand how to have a focused life. We need to stay spiritually focused. If you want to follow along as I read the passage, you can open up your Bibles to Philippians 3, starting in verse 10. And we're going to begin our look at Paul's seminar on staying focused by looking at our need to be focused on a person. So I'm going to start and read verses 10 and 11. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Sounds like some more of the gory stuff that, that uh, Randy was talking about. But knowing Jesus involves more than just knowing about him. It includes developing a relationship with him. Uh, one of my childhood heroes was Roger Staubach. Uh, he was the quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys back in the 70s. And, and I still have a scrapbook I made leading up to the 1978 Super Bowl. And I brought that to show you. It's well beat up, but there are newspaper clippings and you know, all that kind of stuff I have saved. Actually, Mom said she wanted it out of the house. Um, but, uh, and then you got saved. Then I, <laughs> <laughs> all I know is that there's a hole in the top of the stadium so that uh, God can watch his favorite team play football on Sundays. Um, but uh, at, the, at the time, I knew every stat about Roger Staubach. I could tell you his... his passer rating, his completion percentage, the names of his kids and how long he'd been married to his wife. And by the way, her name is Marianne and they've been married 55 years. See, I used to know a whole lot about Roger Staubach, but I've never met him. He doesn't know me at all. He, do, he doesn't even know I exist or that I made a scrapbook about how they got beat by the Pittsburgh Steelers in that Super Bowl. We don't have any kind of relationship at all. You can know all the facts about Jesus, know every word in the Bible about him, but unless you have a relationship with him, you don't really know him. You have no idea what he can do in your life. You don't understand the peace that he brings. You have no clue at all about the strength that he can give, the power he provides through the Holy Spirit, the comfort he brings to our lives. Unless you have a relationship with him, the depth of his love that was shown in his sacrifice is incomprehensible to you. Paul already enjoyed a special relationship with Jesus, but he still longed for even more of Jesus. He wanted a deeper and richer knowledge of Jesus. See, Paul wanted to know everything there was to know about Jesus. He wanted to know the power of his resurrection, as he wrote in verse 10. He wanted to know the power and the strength available to the believer through the resurrection of God's own son, Jesus. See, Paul wrote in Galatians 2.20, this is a very special verse. I've been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Listen to what Paul wrote in Philippians 4.13. This is out of the New Living Translation. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. But at the same time, Paul was seeking out the fullness of the power that he had available to him as a believer. He also felt the need for a constant renewal of that strength and power. And in addition, Paul wanted to know the fellowship of his suffering. Fellowship is sharing or joint participation. Paul felt no one could know, truly know Jesus fully unless they shared in his suffering. Listen to Galatians 6.17 out of the Good News Translation. To conclude, let no one give me any more trouble because the scars I have on my body show that I am the slave of Jesus. Paul tells those that persecuted him to, in some essence, to just leave him alone. He wants them to stop causing him trouble. He's not offering to change his message or, or water it down just to reach some sort of truce with the, the Jewish religious leaders who have been spending so much time harassing him. He simply declares that he belongs to Jesus. 
And what's the evidence that Paul belongs to Jesus? He carries the mark of Jesus on his body. The Greek word for marks is stigmata, and it's often used to describe a brand that's used on cattle or on a slave. Paul's marks, though, weren't put there by Jesus directly. Jesus didn't brand him. They were given to Paul by his persecutors because he preached about Jesus. He wore the scars as a sign of Jesus' ownership over him. He also wrote in 2 Corinthians 4, uh, 10 and 11 in the Good News Translation, At all times we carry in our mortal bodies the death of Jesus so that his life also may be seen in our bodies. Throughout our lives we are, are always in danger of death for Jesus' sake in order that his life may be seen in this mortal body of ours. See, Scripture explains clearly that those believers who carry the gospel uh, are, are just fragile vessels, yet fragile vessels that contain a powerful truth. And in Paul's case, the case in the case of all believers, it's God's power, not our own, that keeps us going in our mission to take the gospel to the world. Believers have been afflicted, per perplexed, persecuted, and struck down, but they have never been crushed or in total despair or abandoned or destroyed. Believers continue to take the gospel to everyone who will listen. And Jesus' mark is on every believer who has suffered for the sake of the gospel. Paul's main point is that he, and by implication us, didn't glorify themselves or carry the message in their own power. They proclaimed Jesus in their weakness and suffering to show his power in and through them. Though suffering for the cause of Christ, Paul came to understand that even became understand even more clearly that what Jesus had suffered for him. And that knowledge helped Paul love Jesus even deeper. And when we understand what Jesus went through for us, the suffering and the death, we realize the depth of his love for us a whole lot better. Paul's desire to know Jesus more fully had at least four aspects, and we can find them in these verses. And the first was a personal experience. He says that I may know him. And secondly, his desire to know Jesus deeper was going to be a powerful experience. Because he says, and the power of his resurrection. Paul also knew that his desire was going to bring a painful experience to him. And the fellowship of his suffering. And the fourth aspect would be a practical experience. Being conformed to his death. See, the beginning of our journey to know Jesus is seen in Romans 6. Uh, take the time to read the, the chapter this week. And when you do, you'll notice the emphasis on Jesus' suffering and his resurrection and our need to conform to his death. See, Paul looked forward to knowing Jesus in that next life, knowing him in a way that we are never going to be able to do in this life. This is uh, evidently what Paul had in mind in, in verse 11. Listen to it out of the New Living Translation. So that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. See, it's an echo of what Jesus said in, in John 5, 28 and 29. Listen to how the New Living Translation puts it. Don't be surprised indeed. Don't be so surprised, sorry. Uh, indeed, the time is coming when all the dead in their graves will hear the voice of God's Son and they will rise again. Those who have uh, done good will rise to experience eternal life and those who have continued in evil will rise to experience judgment. See, Paul looked forward to the time when he could know Jesus fully and completely. We're going to move on and look at verses 12 through 14, where we see that Paul is teaching us that we need to focus on the prize. So 12 through 14. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which I was uh, laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind me and reaching forward to what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. See, Paul could have been a very proud man, proud of all that he had done for the kingdom. When all said and done, Paul had gone on four missionary journeys, 
sharing Jesus and planting churches in areas that Jesus was unknown. He wrote letters to those churches, encouraging and correcting them as needed. And many of those letters became part of our New Testament. See, Paul preached the gospel before kings, yet Paul was humble. He knew that he had accomplished nothing except by the power of God, and that kept him humble. Even in sharing about his focus on obtaining more closeness in his relationship with Jesus, his humility, humility kicks in. He writes in verse 12, this is out of the New Living, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. See, Paul had not yet obtained the full knowledge of Jesus, and that would come at the resurrection. Paul knew that he was not all that he could or should be. If Paul, with everything that he had accomplished and claimed that he had room to grow, what about us? See, the Bible challenges us to grow. In Ephesians 4, uh, by the way, another book written by Paul, he says this, But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects unto him who is the head, that is, Christ. In 2 Peter 3.18, which Paul didn't write, we find this, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and in the day of eternity. Amen. See, growing in our knowledge and our understanding, which leads to, to growing in our relationship with Jesus, it's not just a suggestion, but it's what we are told to do. See, Paul also understood that he wasn't always the Apostle Paul, missionary and role model. He remembered that he used to be Saul, Christian hunter, and the man who attempted to wipe the name of Jesus from the face of the earth. Paul also knew that he had other issues in his life that kept him from being perfect. Instead of letting his past and his present failures become stumbling blocks in his pursuit of Jesus, Paul knew that in Jesus he was forgiven. And we talked a couple weeks ago about the need for forgiveness in our lives. Paul knew that he needed to forgive himself. Paul didn't spend his time regretting. He repented and moved forward. So how did Paul cope with not being all that he could be? Well, with all his baggage from his past and the sins he daily committed, in verse 13, he writes that he was putting the past behind him when he wrote, forgetting what lies behind. See, what did Paul forget? Not just his failures, but his past successes as well. We as believers cannot be dependent on our past successes and our honors. We must continue to grow, to go forward, to learn, to reach forward to what lies ahead, as Paul says. Many believers allow the past to destroy, destroy their present and their future. Yet Hebrews 8.12 tells us that God said, I will forgive their sins and will no longer remember their wrongs. If God no longer remembers our sins, our failings, what business do we have using them as an excuse for not pursuing him? When we dwell on the past, we many times become distracted and discouraged. Paul tells us, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of, of God in Christ Jesus. Listen to verse 13 out of the Good News translation. Of course, my friends, I really do not think that I have already won it. The one thing I do, however, is to forget what is behind me and do my best to reach what is ahead. Here, Paul's intensity is seen. He had a great desire to reach his spiritual goal. What, Paul was, what was Paul reaching for? Paul was reaching for the prize. Paul knew, as, and so should we, that this can only be done when, as we faithfully fulfill our mission of sharing Jesus. We must faithfully... Uh, share Jesus, share the gospel with as many people as we can. Listen to what Paul wrote to his spiritual son in Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, out of the Good News Translation. I have done my best in the race. I have run the full distance and I have kept the faith. And now there is waiting for me the victory prize of being put right with God, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not only to me, but to all those who would wait with love for him to appear. Finally, in Paul's message on staying focused, we're going to, see, we're going to move on and see that uh, we need to be focused on people. 
We're going to look at verses 15 and 16. Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, let me read that one more time because I did not read it perfectly. Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep, keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. People were a genuine concern for Paul, and they should be for us as well. In our earlier verses, we see Paul remaining focused on his life using the words I, me, and myself. But in verse 15, he suddenly shifts to the plural, let us. See, Paul's focus in life was also on others. He wants everyone to have the attitude that he's been describing. He's so sure of this that he even uses a general correction. In verse 15, in the Good News translation, Paul says, but if some of you have a different attitude, God will make this clear to you. He's saying, in other words, some of you might not agree with me, and that's okay. I'm right and you're wrong, and I'm sure God is going to straighten you out. See, he'll bring you around to see things my way. One characteristic of spiritual immaturity is that an as having an inadequate grasp of God's word, not understanding that the whole of scripture fits together and is one story of God's love for us. Someone who's spiritually immature will have a tendency to pull verses out of context and try to build a theology on them with no regard to spiritual context. See, Paul was confident that those who needed to spiritually grow up would get the instruction that they needed to make the proper decisions. He was confident that they would soon learn better. Paul shared something that he felt was very important to the church as a whole. In verse 16, he says, However, let's keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. Unity was very important to Paul, and it needs to be important to us as well. To be spiritually united, we have to have a common authority. Something that we can judge our thoughts and our actions by. And that would be his word, the Bible. See, God's will for us will be easy for us to see if we obediently hold on to his written word. Church, the Bible is our owner's manual. It's our blueprint on how to live life. It's God's love letter to us where he shares how much he loves us and the lengths that he goes to bring us into a right relationship with him. Looking back over our passage this morning, we talked about making sure our focus is on one thing at a time, yet Paul's message to us this morning seems to be threefold. Paul's focus on ours is a singular focus. And all three of these are part of having the same focus, the focus of having Jesus as our priority. When our focus is on him, part of that is focusing on becoming more like him. Becoming more like him means loving people like he did. A single focus with three parts. So what is it that Paul was trying to teach us about becoming and staying focused? I believe he was teaching us that we need to live the focused life and we need to make sure that we stay focused on the spiritual task before us. We need to stay focused on what God has called us to do. And secondly, that to live the focused life, we need to remember that there are many things in life that are important, but none of them are as important as following Jesus. I don't know where you are this morning, where you are spiritually this morning how your spiritual focus is. But I do know that as believers, we are called to live a focused life. And if your life has gotten a little out of focus this morning, today might be a good day to fix that. See, there's a whole world that shouts for our focus, for our attention, but only one that we should, we should be focused on. Maybe you're, you're here this morning and your life is unfocused because you've never made Jesus the main thing in your life. You might have heard about him all your life, and you might know about him, but you have never really known him, never been in a relationship with him. See, one of the lies that the world wants to tell us is that Christianity is too narrow, that it's unaccepting of other beliefs, that there are lots of ways to get to God besides Jesus. Living a good life or following any of the other religions, other religions will bring us to God. But unless you believe that Jesus was a liar, that can't be true. 
See, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. C.S. Lewis, the writer of the series of books, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, was actually a theologian in his own right, and those books are an allegory for the Christian life. He once wrote in his book, Mere Christianity, this argument about Jesus being who he said he was. God, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That's the one thing that we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said that sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says that he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that option open to us. He did not intend to. Now it seems to me obvious that he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend. And consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. What Lewis was saying is that Jesus claimed to be God. His claim is either true or it's false. If it's true, then consequently he is God. If the claim is false, then he either said it knowing that it was false, in which case he was a liar, or he said it not knowing it was false, and in which case he was mentally ill. Therefore, we're left with three logical options. He's either God or a liar or a lunatic. To say Jesus was a liar will seem quite a stretch for most people, even for those who are, are uh, not believers in Jesus' deity, particularly if they think that he was a great moral teacher. A great moral teacher would not, by definition, lie and certainly not tell a lie of such a magnitude to claim to be God when he wasn't. Millions upon millions have died for their belief in what Jesus said. To tell a lie at the cost of so many lives would make him among the world's worst men. To say that Jesus was a lunatic is also a stretch, since his teaching would appear to be the essence of sanity. And of course, a great moral teacher is, again by definition, sane. So the argument grows, if he's not a liar or a lunatic, the only other logical possibility conclusion is that he is God. And notice that among the three logical possibilities, great human moral teacher is not one of them. That Jesus was merely a great human moral teacher is literally not logically possible with his claim of being God. So what do we do with Jesus when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life? I know what I believe. I accepted him as Lord and Savior. What will you do with him this morning? If you'd like to come and talk with or pray with me this morning, I'll be up front as Randy comes and leads us in our final psalm. If you just want to come and pray by yourself at the altar, feel free to do that as well. But whatever God has put on your heart this morning, respond as he leads. May God have his way in each of our lives this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Paul. We thank you that he has, has given us this seminar on living a spiritually focused life. Lord, I pray that if there are parts of our life that are out of focus, if there are parts of our lives where you are not the, the priority, Lord, I pray that you help us fix that this morning. That we give whatever it is that's taken our focus away from you and just lay it at your feet. And Lord, if there are those that are here or online, Lord, that don't know you yet, don't have a relationship with pray, Lord, that you help them become spiritually focused as well. Lord, we thank you that you loved us. We thank you for sending Jesus. We thank you for our forgiveness and our salvation. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. 
benediction comes out of Romans 5, verses 1 through 5 in the Good News Translation. Now that we have been put right with God through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He has brought us by faith into this experience of God's grace in which we now live. And so we boast of the hope we have in sharing God's glory. We also boast of our of our troubles because we know that trouble produces endurance and endurance brings God's approval and his approval creates hope. And this hope does not dis disappoint us for God has poured out his love into our hearts by, by meaning of the Holy Spirit who is God's gift 